Welcome, everyone. I think we're just waiting for a few more people to join. We'll just wait for another minute and then we can start the webinar. Great, I think we can begin um, if you're ready. So thank you very much for joining us this afternoon for this webinar on the anatomy of fraud and corruption in the era of COVID-19. My name is May Mutadi and I'm the International Project Manager at Dodds Training. We deliver training for public sector and different government departments on a variety of different topics, both in the UK and internationally. This afternoon, we wanted to showcase one of our most popular training courses, um, with two of our fantastic associates, Neil McCallum and Tim Salt, uh, who will be going through this with you this afternoon. I am not sure how familiar you are all with GoToWebinar, but at the moment everybody's on mute, and hopefully you can see the first slide with uh, that Neil and Tim are sharing on the screen. I really hope that everybody enjoys this, just so that you're aware the webinar is being recorded and we will send this to you after the session and in a couple of days time. Feel free to share these with your colleagues as well. We can deliver this as a full day training course um, to your team or as part of a uh, program, we can make this bespoke uh, to your needs and to your organization. So again, let me know if this is something that might be of interest to you. As I've said, if you've got any questions, do pop them in the chat function and we'll try and answer as many as we can. I hope you enjoy it and I'll pass you on to Neil and Tim. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, May. And it's a great pleasure uh, to be with you. Thanks to everyone who has joined us. Um, we're going to be spending an hour together uh, and we will have opportunities for questions, which, uh, as May has said, you can either put in the chat function or indeed there is a questions function as well, if you find that easier. We are going to basically ask ourselves some questions about fraud and corruption uh, along these lines. We're going to ask what's changed in the present circumstances and what stayed the same. We're going to look at what are the new vulnerabilities that have arisen uh, over the last few terribly difficult months. We're going to think about whether we should focus on prevention or cure or both. Um, and then we will wrap up with uh, a Q&A session, but we will be happy to take questions at a couple of points during our discussions. We've also got two polls where we're going to ask you a couple of questions. Um, we will aim to wrap this up within an hour and uh, we will be very happy to explore anything which you raise. There are five handouts, which we've also included, um, which uh, are available to you which are all uh, in the public domain, which inform our discussions today. First of all, I should introduce Tim Salt and myself. Uh, we have worked together now for a number of years uh, and in a range of countries um, illustrated here. As you see, our experience is uh, predominantly exclusively really um, Europe, uh, South, Asia and uh, Africa. There is a little bit of experience in the, the uh, Caribbean, uh, but it can't quite be picked out on this map. Um, and uh, that's the two of us working together in Kazakhstan. Uh, our backgrounds are, this is a picture of Tim a little while ago. Tim's background is in law enforcement uh, and he had a long and distinguished career in the police force in uh, the UK, uh, where his, the latter part of his career was heading up a major fraud squad and investigating a range of major frauds and corruption inquiries. 
when he left the police, he continued to work in this area and um, has advised a range of different types of organizations uh, and done training and helped with developing investigative skills. My own background is considerably less uh, glamorous, but also less dangerous as well. Um, my background is in the civil service, working on information management and information security, uh, which I've done, as that photo shows, I still had hair then, um, for quite a long time now. Uh, and I've led a number of internal inquiries uh, into um, security breaches uh, and the like. Uh, we have a range of people. I think uh, we have something like 200 people have registered for this event uh, from around the world. And we've tried to pick out the countries uh, where people have registered from. Uh, and it's great to have so many people from so many different places. And uh, our focus is not going to be UK based or Europe based particularly, but we hope that we can look at examples of issues from around the world. Um, so let's do our first poll. This is really to help us to ensure that we focus on the kinds of things that you particularly might be interested to hear about. So I've put five words there. A, compliance, B, audit, C, risk, D, prevention, and E, investigation. And I fully recognize these are not exclusive terms, but would you be kind enough to choose from those which describes the focus of your work or your interest best? And I'll just give you a moment or two to do that if you'd be so kind. Thank you very much. I think, May, I'll let you decide when is the right moment to close the poll and perhaps tell us what the, the outcome is. Sure, they're just coming in now, so I'll close Excellent. the poll. Yep, so 32% said compliance, 2% said audit. 8% um, said risk, 30% said prevention, and 28% said investigation. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much indeed. That's that's a big help. That's a big help. Thank you. Right, that's much appreciated. What we're talking about, and um, in these first five minutes, 10 minutes or so, I'm going to talk about some things which are fundamental principles, basic principles. So please bear with me if these are things which are very, very familiar to you. But given that we have people from such a range of professional and geographic backgrounds, um, I thought it useful just to touch on how we're using these terms. When we talk about fraud, we are defining that as the intentional use of deceit, to deprive a person or an organization of value. That may be money, but it may be property, it may be a right. It is anything of value. And the key words there are intention, deceit, and deprive. This can be internal fraud or external fraud, corruption. We are thinking about dishonest or unethical behavior by a person entrusted with a position of authority. And it differs from fraud in that this is an abuse of a position of trust. Um, it can be, there's a whole range of different types of corruption people talk about, grand corruption, petty corruption, quiet corruption, noble cause corruption, all of which raise different issues, any of which we're happy to talk about more if, if anyone is particularly interested in, in any one of those. Um, when we look at fraud, uh, people usually talk about the fraud triangle or the fraud diamond, and we've put a document into the handouts uh, about this. Um, these have been around for some time now, these models, which recognize that frauds have certain characteristics. Doesn't matter how they're carried out, um, they all will have motivation, Fraudster will have the opportunity 
and fraudsters rationalize their behavior. The um, fraud diamond adds to that capability in that you, know, you need to be able to do it as well as want to do it and be motivated to do it. You need to have the capability. These are good ways to think about fraud because the removal of any one of those three or in the case of the diamond, four aspects significantly reduces the chance of the fraud being carried out or if attempted being successful. With corruption, we recognize that there are five interlinked areas in a chain and we work in all of these uh, prevention, uh, detection, investigation, prosecution and sanction. And we've worked with financial institutions um, on prevention and detection and within international agencies, with the public sector, uh, with parliaments, uh, with investigation and prosecution. We've worked with um, investigative agencies, specialist agencies like anti-corruption commissions, prosecutorial agencies, and on sanctions, we've worked with judiciaries in a number of countries. Um, and about, you know, almost exactly two years ago today, I was working in Sierra Leone, um, exploring some of the issues with the judiciary around the setting up of a specialist anti-corruption court. Um, again, an area which raises some very interesting issues. This is our key principle, so bear with me. Um, we see that in the world, in any society, in any organization, there are some good people and there are some bad people. And I apologize if the imagery seems a bit um, uh, exclusive, but most importantly, what we recognize is there are a large number of people who are neither good nor bad. Their behavior will be affected by circumstances and the issues that I'm going to come on to next. The good people, you don't have to worry about because they will find out the right way to do things. And if they're in doubt, they simply won't do something until they can find the correct way of doing it. The bad people, all you can do is to set up as many barriers to their attempts to defraud you, or steal from you, um, and try to catch them but you perhaps are unlikely to change their behavior. But what's important is that in our view, the vast majority of people are in that middle group. They are not innately good. And they are not innately bad. They are affected by circumstances and they make choices. And we have to ensure that our systems and structures encourage people and help people to act in the way we want them to and discourage and put barriers in the place of behavior that we don't want. And often our systems, particularly in bureaucracies, in large bureaucracies, seem set up to frustrate the work taking place. And they encourage people to cut corners, to um, avoid the processes, and that's a small step away from cheating to get the job done to cheating for your own advantage. So all of our focus is on the 90%. Now you may feel in your organization, in your country, 20% of people are innately good people and only 1% of people are bad. But that still leaves 79% of people in that middle category. And I think that in general, people are, are adaptable and we will change our behavior according to circumstance. So that's key principle number one for us. Key principle number two is that what leads people to act in certain ways is a fairly simple balancing between cost and benefit. If we think about corruption, where the price of a corrupt act 
and the risk of being caught and the consequences in terms of penalties if you are caught outweigh the potential advantage, you will have less corruption. When the benefit you can achieve is significantly greater than the likely price you have to pay and the risk of being caught or if caught suffering any significant penalty is low, there will be more corruption. That seems to us to be uh, true anywhere in the world. And when we think about corruption uh, and fraud as well, to some extent, but particularly corruption, these are the kinds of things we think about. The top image, uh, bribing a doctor, particularly relevant at the moment in terms of, of you know, accessing healthcare, rare resources, um, supplies that are in limited availability. Um, the, the picture below that of you know, buying freedom uh, for money from the justice system, buying a judge's decision or under the table dealing in general to achieve contracts, etc. Uh, these are pretty traditional ways of thinking about corruption. And uh, again, in the UK in particular, we've had in the past this idea that dealing with corruption is about finding the one bad apple in the barrel. Uh, if you can remove that apple, the corrupt police officer or whatever, then the rest remain pure and decent and unaffected. But if they stay in the barrel, they cause that rot to spread throughout the organization. And we've moved in recent years uh, to recognize that our aim is not to eradicate corruption, but to control and manage corruption. And in many countries in which we've worked, corruption is far more complex than the naive view that it is about a person with money taking advantage of people who have none. Uh, it, in many cases, it is about money moving around in a different way. And we're all victims, but often many of us, if not all of us, are also at times perpetrators as well. There isn't a simple um, criminal and victim distinction as people like to portray it sometimes and as um, exists perhaps with other crimes. So the challenge is when we look at um, fraud and corruption uh, is to think about what it is we're actually looking at it at. Is this about need? And I would argue that if you pay people who have power and discretion less than the money they basically need to be able to feed their families, to educate their children, to get health care for their aged parents, then corruption becomes a matter of need and um, ingrained in society. Or is it simply greed? Uh, or is it an entire alternative economy as a I would argue it is in a number of, of situations. There is also an issue about the confusion of what the crime is with how the crime is committed. Fraud is theft by a particular means. And there is a danger that by focusing on how it's done rather than what it is, we um, don't help ourselves in dealing with it. And I think that one can arguably see a similar thing with focusing on gun crime and knife crime and terrorism uh, rather than the acts which are at the crimes which are actually being perpetrated. Um, as I've already said, we are prone to oversimplify these things. We're also prone to externalize them. They're not our problem. It doesn't happen here. Um, and, you know, my perks of the job is somebody else's corruption. Uh, and we can generally be a bit naive. And I think when we move on to talk about vulnerabilities, as we're just about to, um, then I think that this question of naivety and vulnerability 
tend to sort of go hand in hand. So that is my very quick overview of our terms and definitions and our approach. Um, and I'm going to invite um, Tim now to uh, look at some of the new vulnerabilities which uh, we are seeing. And uh, Tim, if you'd just like to tell me when you want me to move on the slides, I will hand over to you. Thank you yes. very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Neil. Uh, very interesting session and, and welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm here to uh, discuss new vulnerabilities uh, within the time of the current pandemic. And when I saw the title, I find it quite interesting because I've found in the recent months it quite difficult to find out any new frauds. Fraud has been around for hundreds, perhaps even thousands of years, ever since people were trading together and moving around. And of course, as things have increased, we're now a global village. So the movement of people has enabled fraud and corruption to spread like the virus worldwide. And I wonder if in actual fact, what we are looking at is old frauds committed by new methods. But also Neil mentioned of the word opportunities. And what the pandemic seems to me has done has provided many opportunities, many more opportunities for people to commit fraud uh, and corruption. And may perhaps be shifting some of Neil's 90% into the 5% bad bracket. Of course, the 5% bad bracket are the professional fraudsters who are very astute at moving around, challenging us with their new methods. The 90% who move across into that bracket are the ordinary people working in your office who may see an opportunity arise, which with the proper systems and procedures in place, probably we could prevent. Thank you, Neil. It is, as we said, worldwide. And this is a, a coronavirus demonstration that took place in Kenya. The targets were the official government officials and business people. It's interesting to see that most of the protesters are wearing masks and I'm not sure whenever those masks are there because of the pandemic or because of the tear gas that's being used. But ostensibly they were protesting about corrupt officials, increase in prices of personal protection equipment, inflated prices, they were complaining about misuse of government funds and also the tendering, as I said, of, of contracts. And I would suggest to you that there is nothing new in the basis of what they were uh, complaining about. They're not new frauds, but they're old vulnerabilities, they're old frauds, but they have new opportunities. Thank you, Neil. Again, to show its worldwide basis, this is in Japan. And in Japan, there's been a rise in the increase of, of uh, people illicitly obtaining grants from the government. And it's interesting here because we've seen, certainly uh, uh, in, in my area, many, many posters asking us to uh, keep our distance, to wash our hands, uh, uh, but I don't think I've seen anyone, which this one in Japan is, which is actually pointing out that taking funds illicitly is a criminal offence. Thank you.
again, perhaps this is showing also the progress of how old frauds, old scams have happened. We probably, well, most of us may remember the 419 letters that used to be received, transferred to telephones and now to technology. And this is a very, very recent case where the daughter of the former president, Jerry Rawlins in Ghana, who died recently, has been warning people about online fraudsters who claim to be raising money for her father's funeral and, of course, are scamming it from whoever is making the donation. Anything new in the scam? I suggest not. If we look on a broader span across Europe, the authorities are warning again of, of the fraud. And in March of this year, they reported that pandemic fraud had actually risen by 400% at a cost of, I think it's 4 billion euros. The targets of the frauds, PPE and phishing, seeking for information. Not few, sorry, not new, but enabled by the pandemic perhaps to give more people the opportunity to commit the fraud. We move to America potentially billions of dollars through the disaster relief fund may have been improperly distributed as part of the federal government's coronavirus relief efforts. What were these frauds or mistakes? Paying money into wrong accounts, paying grants to illegible people, making multiple loans to many people, it makes, again, not new scams. They weren't all scams, but I don't think there's necessarily anything new. But there are people who've taken the opportunity to commit fraudulent acts. South Africa reports misuse of COVID-19 funds are described as frightening. Again, one of the main issues, complaints, PPE fraud, or the increase five times in the cost of PPE above the, the Treasury's uh, limit. And linked within that, currently 30,000 relief grant uh, uh, frauds or potential frauds are being investigated. And again, coming back to And one asks the question, how many of those people who've misused the funds they were given are actually in the 90%? Not professional fraudsters, but people who've seen the opportunity when they're down in their luck, they're having a very hard time, perhaps being put out of work to obtain some much needed funds. And finally, just in this little session, Australia, during the pandemic, they have seen a 76% rise in rental scams. Rental scams are people who are offering premises for rent, which either don't exist or aren't theirs to let out. And it's a form of phishing where what they are doing is obtaining bank details, names and address, or even some cash deposits. Thank you, Neil. Oh, that's slightly unfortunate. Are you in a position to read that, Neil? Because my screen is covered. Um, right. Forgive me if I miss odd words, but yeah, at times of crisis, hackers sense an opportunity. Unfortunately, when hospital staff are having to go above and beyond the call of duty, uh, in an effort to tackle and halt the spread of coronavirus, they aren't thinking about cyber security. Hackers know this and will be targeting the health se care sector. And that's a quote uh, from uh, Flavius Plesno, 
from the Rural Hospital in the Czech Republic. Thank you very much. Again, it's a question of opportunity. Professional fraudsters to 5% are, are, are able to seize. And it's quite interesting to see on the BBC News at lunchtime that uh, the international vaccine supply chain uh, has already been hacked by the cyber espionage. Uh, it, it's, it's already started, even perhaps on the first day that these vaccines have been delivered. Thank you, Neil. So if we look at procurement, which I, I have mentioned, procurement in crisis. Well, it's interesting. If you look historically, 1916, our country produced a new anti-corruption act because of disagreements in contracts between the government and contractors who are supplying equipment to, to the government for the war. So again, it's not new. What is also true and often ignored is that some people have done very well throughout the crisis and quite legitimately. They've met their targets, they've produced whatever has been required on time. And as a commercial organization, they have made money out of doing it perfectly legally. And we read every day with the press allegations, press reports, not all of them are accurate. And this is very important when we're judging the, the full effect of fraud and corruption during, during this pandemic. It's true, safeguards can be lowered in a crisis, providing the opportunity uh, for the unscrupulous people. There's a little story I heard here about uh, a, a man going to a supplier for some PPE and they were agreeing the contract and the supplier asked is uh, uh, and what about payment and the man replied it's our normal 60 days normal terms and conditions and the company director just said I have a man in the next door room with a suitcase full of cash. I wonder who was breaking their individual company safeguards. And we do have a temptation during such pandemic, such times of trouble, to lower our standards. Companies must resist the temptation to sacrifice their control systems, governance, an appropriate culture to adjust to the new realities of COVID-19. Do you have within your organizations a fraud adverse culture? Do you have accountancy and transparency? Do you have the right controls for your system? And have they just been disregarded during the current pandemic? If you do have them in place, have they just been ignored bypassed or are they just simply breaking down because so many people are off work so many people have been furloughed or so many people are sick have your systems been adapted to the changing circumstances of the covid19 pandemic and now we'll discuss later a little bit about working from home are people transparent? Are people accountable in, in what they're doing? And a very simple example of people changing and adapting circumstances for the pandemic that I've heard of, of a hospital that had no problems with PPE equipment. And when asked why, they said simply on the first day, they locked the cabinet in which the 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 equipment was stored to stop people from stealing it and they had no trouble or haven't had at this stage and moment in time coping with the pandemic 
And finally for this, we ask the question, does the end justify the means? We have shifted heaven and earth to get 32 billion items of PPE into this country. And I'm very proud of what has been achieved, which is a comment by our prime minister. But I do wonder if we've kept our eye on the ball to see how it has been achieved what has been achieved and at what cost and to whom. Yeah. Some reports which have just come through, uh, 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 again, only from one newspaper. And we must remember with all these reports, they've not been through the courts. They're speculative. They have comments made by the uh, uh, particular newspapers. But there have been allegations some suppliers with political contracts uh, um, have effectively been given government contracts and because they knew a government official or somebody within government, they were 10 times more likely to get the contract. Companies with no relevant experiences pocketed, and I can't read it on the screen here, uh, uh, so Twelve many billion, billion. Twelve, 12 million, billion. thank you, billion, M million, billion pounds uh, uh, in the shambolic scramble for PPE. And uh, a fairly straightforward example of that is uh, a sweet maker who had no experience whatsoever in making any PPE, uh, but received. I think it's 108 million pounds worth uh, of contracts without going through any tendering or any checking procedure. And again, the question is asked of a US jewellery designer who uh, provided some gloves and gowns for the National Health Service, but was handed a number of lucrative contracts worth somewhere in the region of around two million pounds. And he employed 200, a young, million. 200 million, sorry. And he started by handing a contract to a young entrepreneur uh, with a contract worth of 880,000 pounds. And again, what checks and what balances have been in place? Or have people seen an opportunity for them to be able to commit fraud or corrupt acts. Thank you. So as Neil said, where are we? What Indeed. is the current, sorry, what is the current situation? Should we prosecute? Again, that's an opportunity for us, but when should we start doing that? Should we do it at the end of the crisis or at the beginning of the crisis? Who should we prosecute? Perhaps most crucially, do we have the resources? Do we have the experience? And certainly in our country, would we even have the court space to try everybody who has allegedly uh, committed fraud or, or corruption during the pandemic? Should we prevent it? Many people may argue with, with some strength that it's a bit late for that, but could we prevent losing any more money? Um, our National Audit Office reckons that on the bounce back loans, this country stands to lose somewhere in the region of 25 billion pounds. So if we could prevent any further loss, then surely that has to be a good thing. Similar argument really for deterrence. Do we introduce a system now that will deter any further fraud being committed? Do we ignore it? Do we say this has been a one in a lifetime event, we'll have a cut off date, an amnesty, truth commission, but we will not prosecute anybody. We will just start from a particular day and forget all that's gone in the past. Or should we, in a similar vein, forgive people because of the unfortunate circumstances they've been in, laid off, we've seen in the catering business, uh, 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 losing money and being unable to exist. 
just an example of one of the things we can do in Japan. Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry has already implemented a system which exempts individuals who have received benefits illicitly from penalties. And it's urging people who've received them illegally, illegitimately, to return the money one way forward. And probably a summary of everything that I think both of us have said or been saying is, while some fraud was expected, and Neil, I think, emphasised that right at the beginning, the level of fraud is high and it's due at least somewhat to poor internal controls and oversight and probably removed, sorry, not removed, moved considerable amount of people from out of that 90% bubble that Neil was talking about. Thank you, Neil. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Tim. Um, there's, uh, we'll just carry on to our next poll, our final poll. Um, and you, for those of you who are not from the UK, it doesn't matter at all because this I'm choosing an example from England and Wales because we know the numbers. But in England and Wales, so the largest part um, of the UK, well over one and a half million, it's now approaching two million, coronavirus business loans have been issued up to mid-October. How many? have been reported to the police as suspicious. Do you think it might be A, between 5,000 and 50,000 of them? Bear in mind, we're talking about over one and a half million individual loans. Is it between 500 and 5,000? Or is it C, less than 500? And if you'd be kind enough, please, to just say which you think, in the light of your experience and knowledge, it's most likely to be. Thank you very much, May, and I'll let you know when, let, I'll ask you to let us know when the, the poll has uh, been adequately completed. Thank you. Okay, a few more seconds. Last few votes coming in. Okay. Yep, so I've just shared the results. So 39% voted for uh, between 5,000 and 50,000. 32% uh, voted for uh, between 500 and 5,000. And 29% voted for less than 500. Excellent, right. Thank you very much. Well. There is no prize for the right answer, but the right answer is actually C, less than 500. In fact, it's far less than 500. Uh, as at the end of October, it was 179. Now, given the amount of money that um, is generally accepted has been wrongly paid out, that is a staggeringly low number, 179 out of well over one and a half million. Uh, and it's interesting to think about why that might be. Why is the reporting rate so low? And we can return to that uh, later. Okay, so thank you very much, Tim, for that overview of new vulnerabilities. On this question of prevention or cure, uh, there has been uh, a move urged uh, to have far greater data sharing. And uh, there is a mention of earlier experience, um, and we will touch on that shortly. But experience generally shows that fraudsters are immensely quick to spot an opportunity and to exploit it. And as Tim said, there is already threats to the supply chain um, for uh, vaccines. And in fact, I think it was today, um, if not, then it was last night, uh, Interpol issued a warning generally to police forces to anticipate and expect 
both attacks on that supply chain, but also the marketing of fake um, and counterfeit uh, medicines. Data sharing is the way forward uh, for dealing with many of these frauds because, of course, international boundaries uh, have little meaning anymore uh, in this area. Um, there is a, a, a good example, a positive example of the benefits of data sharing um, in the area of romance fraud. Uh, and a significant amount of money, as you'll see, has been repatriated from Ghana uh, to the UK uh, to the victims of romance fraud uh, through some excellent international partnership working. Uh, and we have seen a significant growth, um, action fraud estimated at 26% growth um, in the UK of romance fraud uh, between October 2019 and October 2020. And I will readily admit that um, I, uh, as any of you would have, could have predicted significant numbers of false claims for loans, false claims for furlough payments, um, and some dodgy procurement going on. It hadn't occurred to me that romance fraud, love fraud, would be one of the areas we would see such a dramatic growth in. And I'm kind of disappointed in myself that I didn't think of that because it kind of follows logically uh, and depressingly from the fact that there are significant numbers of people home working, vulnerable, financially vulnerable, lonely, um, and are the opportunities are just greater. And once again, it's the opportunity part of that triangle or that diamond that we see as being the significant area um, where change is happening. So romance fraud, is it due to more home working? And um, it's difficult to see what other single most obvious um, contributory factor we could identify. In any case with home working, there's big questions about what duty of care employers have to people working from home and what rights employees working from home have in terms of personal privacy um, and the balance between the workplace and the domestic setting. Uh, and um, one, uh, one newspaper has commented on the shift to working from home during the pandemic has seen a boom in surveillance software. And that technology threatens further the boundaries between home and work and is likely to create a culture of paranoia and a breakdown of trust within an organization. But these are real serious questions. What does the responsibility have uh, and do employers have and, and how is that balanced with the rights of employees? And our systems, almost everywhere, have been developed for the ways in which people have worked for a good century or more in offices, in organizations. And whilst home working has been part of that, this dramatic shift raises some important new challenges for all of us. Um, just thinking about lessons from the past. Um, it's not that long ago that we had the Ebola crisis and there were significant examples then of fraudsters taking advantage of the need for agencies to move with speed, agencies to be shifting large amounts of money in different ways and to different places than they had been in the past and the opportunities being spotted to take advantage of that. And this identifies the Red Cross um, uh, as uh, admitting the scale of fraud um, and the type of frauds they were victim to, but they were far from uh, alone in that. And there are many, many, sadly, other cases of fraudsters taking advantage of that situation. 
And if we go back even further, um, the, the, scrabble for, the scramble for masks and PPE um, is not new. Uh, back in the uh, Spanish flu pandemic after the First World War, the same thing was seen, uh, as was what is the concern of Interpol um, right now. Um, treatments are uh, being advertised and being sold without any significant uh, testing or credibility and basically uh, fake cures. So a lot of this is not new. And if there is a theme through what we've been talking about, it is that the vulnerabilities may be new. But as Tim has said, the frauds, the way the fraud is done is not in so as far as we can see, hardly ever a new type of fraud. The type remains the same. The, the circumstance has changed and the opportunities. And we end this bit by thinking about a few questions. Would the removal of words like COVID, coronavirus, Ebola or pandemic from the reports make any difference to the inquiry or the investigative process? And we would argue that it doesn't. That's about the context, but not about the crime. Would the fraud or corruption have taken place in one form or another anyway? Um, the next question is a, a typical lecturer's question because we think the answer is yes. Uh, it is, is it time for fraud and corruption to become a higher priority? Um, and I think we've seen in many countries that fraud, corruption, economic crime, financial crime uh, has dropped down the agenda um, for many law enforcement agencies at exactly the time when the number of incidences and the impact of this type of crime has increased. And the next two part question, I genuinely don't know the answer to, uh, and I think that nobody does, but perhaps this is the most serious challenge for us all moving forward. Will this crisis lead to more resources and a higher profile for tackling fraud and corruption? Or will it institutionalize what um, is called in the UK chumocracy. Um, this is um, again a new expression for an old thing, jobs for the boys, contracts for my mates, um, helping out um, a, a chum with uh, a lucrative government contract and less accountability and transparency. I think a number of people fear that actually we are seeing a reduction in values and standards which may last beyond the the pandemic now all of this can sound horribly depressing and uh it's always important to remember that we are looking at uh threats within a context of the vast majority of people working hard to try and make things better and um courageous health workers around the world and generous billionaires as well uh, getting supplies and an agreement with Ethiopian Airlines to fly um, supplies around Africa that uh, Jack Ma has donated. There's lots and lots of good stuff happening but uh, it behoves those of us uh, who and I note the jobs you described yourselves in or your focus um, in the first poll those of us particularly who are involved with prevention uh, and those of us who are concerned with investigation um, and uh, detection to do our best to ensure that limited resources go where they're meant to. So um, I'm just going to pause at this point to invite any questions. We've got just a couple of minutes left and i see a hand go up so uh, any questions that you have we would be happy to uh, attempt to deal with and there is one question uh i can see right you can about... put questions in the question yep. box that would be useful 
<laughs> okay. Um, one question that uh, was asked independently of this is if there is one thing that we could do, just one thing to focus on for an organization, for those of us concerned with this area of work, what do we think that should be? And we will be answering that question in just a moment with our final thoughts. Um, we, okay, I think. Right, let me move on to those final thoughts and we're still in answering mode if anybody wants to, to raise anything. We've got two final thoughts here. One is from a report from just a couple of days ago um, about the dual threat that parts of Italy are facing from both the mafia and uh, the pandemic. Uh, and these are the words of um, the owner of a restaurant which uh, was initially closed down by the mafia uh, under threat from the mafia because uh, he wasn't willing to pay bribes. Uh, and now has been closed down again because of the pandemic. And he said, uh, the mafia and COVID are both pandemics. We'll destroy the virus with a vaccine, but the fight against the mafia will take longer. And I think that you could replace the word mafia with fraud and corruption. Uh, and that statement remains every bit as valid. And uh, the other thing we wanted to add was from a colleague of ours who, who works often with us on these programs. And he says very wisely, we can't prevent every single fraud from happening. But what we can prevent is our organizations from turning fraudulent and corrupt. And if you think about organizations around the world, um, whose ethical behavior in recent years has been questionable, one can see sometimes a pattern of behavior and it is possible to identify organizations moving from being quick and perhaps indulging in a bit of sharp practice to actually becoming fraudulent organizations. And the role of all of us within organizations should be to do everything possible to prevent our organizations from becoming fraudulent organizations or corrupt agencies. So that brings us to the end of our time and we are just approaching uh, the end of our hour. So Sorry, uh, if... uh, we have a few questions coming in. Um, oh, excellent. So good, good, good. So someone asked, uh, my understanding from UK Cabinet Office is that Bayes have received over 10,000 referrals regarding fraudulent bounce back loans. So not police referrals, but clearly a problem. Absolutely. Uh, I think absolutely. that was more of a statement, but yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There, there uh, and, is, and I, Tim, carry on. There is a monthly bounce uh, back loans done by the National Audit Office. So carry on. Yeah, yeah, we have, we have, uh, we included something in the handouts there. Um, there is an issue around. Um, the reporting of fraud generally and the priority which law enforcement gives it in a number of countries and arguably and this is a huge big debate uh which we aren't going to get done in the, the little bit of time we've got left this externalizing of making corruption or economic crime the responsibility of a separate agency rather than the main law enforcement and prosecutorial bodies there's a debate i think about whether that it in the long term helps or hinders the fight against financial crime. But that's a conversation for another day. Uh, May, other, other points or questions? Um, someone else asked, how can one tackle corruption where integrity and empathy does not exist? Gosh, that's, <laughs> that's a wonder. I'm gonna write down this, the, that integrity and empathy. I think that's such a wise question uh there are ways and there are things uh that can be done and maybe the issue is this one about our organizations i mean both tim and i uh have had the honor of knowing incredibly um honest people with profound integrity working in 
deeply corrupt environments um, and it isn't easy and uh, it, it's it would be so easy for someone like me to give you a glib answer I think your use of the word empathy is really really important because I think if there is one thing and it's part of the rationalization um, that fraudsters indulge in is this complete lack of empathy a complete lack of concern for the harm their actions do. Tim, is there anything you'd like to add to that? No, I think it's uh, it's a very good question, and, and if we knew the answer to that, the world would be a better place. Quite honestly. Indeed. I mean, I, I remember speaking to one of these people um, that I've described, you know, a person of profound uh, integrity, um in a deeply corrupt environment uh and i said to him why do you bother why do you bother the issue was i had offered to pay for lunch for him we'd gone out for lunch together and he said don't bother i'd sooner pay for it myself because if you pay for my lunch i'm gonna have to fill out a form and declare it um and that's gonna be that's gonna take me an hour and i'd sooner just pay for my own lunch thanks and I said, why, why do you bother? Nobody else is filling out those forms. You know, your people throughout your organization, your bosses, you know, and I know, are profoundly corrupt. And his answer was, because I'm the only person in this organization that nobody has anything on. I'm the only free man in this organization. Now, that was what he said, whether that's a valid statement or not, um, it was it was his view but i particularly take the the linking of integrity and empathy and that's that's really helpful thank you anything else mate uh, someone asked what are your thoughts on the term zero tolerance right i th oh tim do you want to <laughs> i want to think for a moment tim do you want to say anything while i just mull on that I think, you know, hard cases, as I say, make, make bad law and uh, zero tolerance, of course, never is zero tolerance uh, because uh, it will depend upon who's doing it, what their position is, uh, is in society. And in my view, it doesn't exist. It never can exist because it's different interpretations and different cases. Do, do you say that you have zero tolerance so you prosecute a traffic policeman whose monthly wage is not enough to live on whilst perhaps a senior member of government is stealing millions of pounds out of the country every day of the week? Uh, uh, if zero tolerance applies across the board, then I have no problems with it. But I suspect and I suspect you feel the same, that zero tolerance is not zero tolerance and never will be. No, I, I completely agree with what Tim has said. And I think that um, it touches a bit on uh, what I said about naivety. Um, it's a bit like declaring a war on terror. Uh, you're not defining clearly enough what it is you're trying to stop. To have uh, a fraud resistant culture is absolutely right. And if, if that's what people understand by the expression zero tolerance, that is absolutely great. And if that's the slogan, that's super. But I think um, when it goes beyond being a slogan to um, being um, in, sort of imposed, exactly as Tim says, it really becomes quite complex because I think it's quite a layer of hypocrisy in the way people interpret that and as, as i said earlier you know this is the perks of a job for me for somebody else if i see someone else take that same perk i regard that as a corrupt act so it's defining what it is that we are zeroing the tolerance on that's the challenge thank you for that a very important point may anything uh, else i know i know we have quite a few uh, questions which i don't think uh, we can answer all of them now um but maybe if you just take one more question if that's okay neil and tim of course, um of so 
Someone said, hello, I am joining from Albania. In the experts' knowledge, which sectors of the economy are most targeted by fraud and corruption in this situation? Right, well, welcome, and thank you very much for being with Ooh. us. Um, I shall I shall ask Tim to add to what I'm just going to say, but um, anywhere where the public sector meets the private sector, and there is a level of discretion in how the public sector works, and particularly where money can change hands. So areas around procurement are obviously um, high risk areas and um, defense procurement. So military procurement is in many, many countries a risk area because people claim security concerns for not releasing the information. So closed tendering to processes where there is a degree of um, a lack of transparency and accountability and wherever there's significant money moving around that's that that would be my answer so procurement classically and in the areas where big procurement is happening big amounts of money are being spent tim no i think that's absolutely correct uh, uh neil i would just put the caveat that we uh should all remember that fraud is actually committed by people it may be enabled by technology and other matters, but it's people that commit the fraud. And if we concentrate on treating people decently, uh, our, our, our workforce decently, and we have the right fraud adverse culture, then we can go some way towards halting the rise in, in fraud. Uh, um, as, as the last uh, handout, handout said. Um, but I think. We want to remember too, as I say, mainly that it's people that commit fraud and it's the environment that you get people to work in that you make it that can actually be the biggest offence that there is. Thank you. Right, thank you, Tim. May, do you want to, where are we? Well, a little over time, I'm quite happy to carry on and answer a couple more questions. I recognise that we're, we're going beyond time, so apologies for that, but is there anything else that we could explore? Sure. Um, there is uh, another question. Have, having recently been the victim of fraud um, by misrepresentation by the building trade, do you have any advice on how this can be prevented? Well, I, to talk about any particular case, um, one is probably not the right format and two or the right forum to do it in and two, we need a lot more information. But if you have been the victim, key thing you need to do, um, I guess, and please remember, I'm speaking from ignorance here. I'm only going on the few words that you've said. Um, you need to ensure that you've got your evidence lined up of what has happened. You have as much recorded information as possible um, and you seek redress of that through agencies which can help you. Um, and they may be professional agencies if if um, this uh, contractor um, is is governed by a professional agency. Um, it may be some other approach. Uh, Tim, what would you say? It's it is very difficult without knowing some circumstances of the offence. Um, ideally, and I realise that in some areas of the world this is not pos possible you would be able to go and report it to the police or the equivalent of, of the town hall. Um, as Neil said, make sure you keep anything which is, is of evidential value and, and frankly seek advice, but without knowing where you, where you live or the circumstances that are there, it's very difficult to uh, give any further advice without knowing the circumstances. But I think Tim makes a very important point about seeking advice. Um, and in most countries, well, certainly I think in all the countries we've worked in, there will be some advice point, which may not necessarily be the police, may not necessarily be the anti-corruption agency or the Economic Crime Commission. Um, but there, there will be 
places where you can get advice and get good advice which is going to help you. I'm sorry we can't be more precise or helpful than, than that, but we wish you luck in uh, recovering um, the, the, the losses which you've so unfortunately suffered. Thank you. Um, I do think we should now uh, try and close up. <laughs> uh, do you have any other final words, Neil or Tim, before I, uh, I close up? Uh, from me only to thank everyone for being with us and being so patient and we hope that you found this valuable it's an area which i hope we've made clear we find deeply interesting and we've spent many many years working on and uh we find endlessly fascinating so um we hope that this has helped to focus minds on the fact that opportunity is perhaps the theme which runs through this um reducing opportunities for fraud and corruption is really the single most important lesson to take away from this i think tim i'd just like to say thank you all uh, uh, very much thank you very much to may for uh, helping uh, to put on the webinar and i hope very much that in the not too distant future we will actually all be able to meet in person or actually see you and give live demonstrations and answer your questions uh, more fully than we're able to over this medium. But uh, thank you all very much. And thanks to Dodds for uh, inviting me along. Absolutely. Thanks very much indeed. OK, brilliant. Well, thank you so much again, Tim and Neil. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for joining. We will be sending out the recording of the webinar along with its content. Do bear with us as this may take a few days uh, to collate and to send out to all. Uh, feel free to send it out to your colleagues also. Um, if anyone is interested in any follow-up training, please do get in touch. We are also hoping to do more webinars in the future. So if there's anything you would like us to, to, to discuss, then please let us know. We're always happy to hear your suggestions. Uh, thank you very much for uh, making the time this afternoon to join us. And thanks again to Neil and Tim uh, for the very, very interesting webinar. Thank you. Thank you.